Good passage of scripture. The title of the message is, and I didn't realize how corny it was until right before I got ready to say it, only you can prevent forest fires. That's pretty corny, I know. But, uh, that, that's too much weight on here. This thing won't hold it. <laughs> only you can prevent forest fires. Oh, I got to think of a better title for that. If you come up with something, let me know. I want to talk about, first of all, the destructive power of a fire. And of course, you know where I'm going in relationship to the tongue. But uh, I think, I don't know how many stories I've told you all about the, when I worked on a farm. Now, I'm not a farm boy. Uh, I enjoyed working on the farm, but I had no experience about that. And I could tell you a lot of stories about some dumb stuff I did on the farm. I mean, not knowing, like it was the first time I was ever somewhere where you could burn your trash. How many people can burn your trash where you are? Amen. And I wish I could do that. And stuff would just end up out there that was just junk, you know, that needed to be burned. I remember throwing a TV in the fire one time thinking, I wonder what would happen. And, I mean, it was like this like, a pillar of cloud by day, <laughs> right? Just, uh, these strange colors. I was like, I don't think I should be here. <laughs> right? I just did some dumb stuff on the farm. Uh, I won't tell you about the time I put gas in the radiator of the tractor. But, anyway, that's another matter. <laughs> I was dumb, okay? And so I learned a lot of things on the farm, but... I'll tell you one, a couple experiences. What's funny is I ended up being working on the volunteer fire department uh, just only about a few blocks away from where this farm was. That's, an, that's another story. But uh, this is the day I almost burnt down the farm, okay? Uh, I had a bunch of trash that had been piling up. The little burn pile wasn't enough, okay? So I built a little pen in the back field uh, with corrugated sheet metal, you know, I drove some stakes down the ground, put this sheet metal up there, nailed it all in place. I thought that's going to be a huge help. I can just burn stuff in there, walk away. That metal will protect it from uh, the fire spreading anywhere, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> it goes underneath the metal. <laughs> it crawls up all the grass and everything. And I'm going to doing my chores, feeding the horses. Uh, who knows what else I was doing, weed eating, something like that. And I look back and there's just smoke everywhere. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm working for this old couple. I mean, they were like nearly 100. I probably couldn't see what was going on anyway, so I wasn't too worried about that. But I'm thinking I really don't want like the next day this whole entire farm is just like burnt to ashes <laughs> and try to explain to them uh, how this happened, right? But I did. I turned my back and, and whenever I got over there, it was like, you know, they had one of those spigots that you, 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 you pumped up like that. And you fill up your bucket, and then you go over there, and whoosh, I mean, it didn't do a thing. The fire's just growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. And finally, I realized, uh, you know, all this uh, grass, tall grass, is what's caught on fire. And it's going to go right over to those trees. Once the trees go, then the barn's going to go. Once the barn goes, I mean, everything is going to be destroyed. I'm freaking out, right? And I'm just trying everything to get water and everything. Finally, I realized, right, well, what I can do is just go ahead of the fire and just remove all that stuff before it catches on fire and then just let everything burn out. And thankfully that worked, okay? <laughs> Sometimes fire will leap over some uh, large spaces that you didn't know about. But I remember just looking at just the power of that fire and it's so hot too, like trying to get anywhere near it. You've been to bonfires and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, uh, this is not good. Like, I'm not gonna die. I'm gonna get out of here before this thing takes over. But this whole barn, this whole farm is gonna burn up. And I remember just looking at that and thinking about the power, thinking about how that. Then I was on the volunteer fire department, like I said, uh, we would go sometimes to a grass fire and just see just how fast it can just spread and trees catch on fire and, and, uh, and barns with uh, hay bales all throughout it, you know, catch on fire. The destructive power of this fire. One quick, just kind of historic example, you've probably heard of the Chicago fire of 1871 and uh, thousands of houses destroyed. Hundreds of people died in this fire. And I don't know, can you imagine how much money it must have cost to re rebuild all that and repair all that? And legend says that what happened was a cow kicked over a lantern in the barn. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the story that's told. How would you like to be that guy, right? <laughs> that huge fire started because I left the lantern on in the barn with a cow in there and uh, the whole thing ended up uh, blowing up. But the destructive power, look at chapter, uh, James chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire 
kindled. I mean, when you think about the fact that that's just a little spark sometimes that it takes to get that thing started, uh, just a little spark or, or a flame. And it's funny because if you're trying to start a fire, sometimes it takes a lot of work and you're like, oh man, wood's not dry enough. And it takes a lot of work to start a fire, but whenever just fires just kind of start themselves, you're thinking, how did that happen? <laughs> just one little spark or something like that. And before you know it, uh, enough stuff catches on fire and it just kind of uh, snowballs, I guess isn't the right word when you're talking about fire, but <laughs> it just kind of turns into this just great out of control thing. And uh, it's uncontrollable at some point. Verse 3 uh, in verse three says this, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn over their whole body. That one little thing that's in that horse's mouth, if you've ever uh, ridden a horse, uh, you know, or if you read bareback, I did bareback one time, we just pull its hair. You know, you want it to go this way, you just pull its hair and it would go, I don't know, it would be a really well-trained horse. But that bit that's in its mouth, when you yank on the reins, it por forces that thing and it'll go whichever way you want. This big old horse, like if it was smart enough, it would say, I'm just going to kick this guy off of here and go do my own thing. But man, and God gave us this power, it's pretty amazing, right? How to control the beast, we can get things to do whatever we want them to do. Uh, they put bits in a horse's mouth. Have you ever seen how they uh, uh, can tame animals, make animals act like human beings almost, right? Dress them up and make them do all these things. Almost every animal has been able to be tamed, but what the Bible says is that the tongue, such a small member of the body, and it says this, no man can tame, right? What did it say in verse, uh, verse let me see here, verse... One or two, uh, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. How many in here think that you're a perfect man? <laughs> and you can just control the tongue at all times and not let it get out of control. <clears throat> but here's what we see is that although we can control animals, we can, we can control so many things in this life, oftentimes what we fail to control is something that seems so insignificant, so small and minor, and that is our tongue. Now, uh, it's amazing, uh, you know, how, how quick our tongue can get out of control. We don't even really realize it. Uh, you know, nowadays... What we see a lot of us use social media, right? So now we don't necessarily have where we're up there not controlling our, our tongue and conversation from house to house, or we're not controlling our tongue, uh, you know, on the telephone or whatever like they used to. But now you get on tweet, Twitter, like I don't, that's the only one I don't use, I think, but you get on Twitter, make a tweet. And even the president, you know, can't control sometimes what, what comes out of there, right? Sometimes we get out of control, we put things on there. Now, in thinking about this, this isn't necessarily why I, I'm preaching this message today, but think about this. There's two things that just came up just recently, either just in conversation, just kind of watching things or talking to people or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna be, it's going to be a little specific. I'm not trying to call anybody out or anything like that, but I'm just saying if we can kind of, uh, get this thing going the right direction and make sure we're all on the same page and it won't ever get to a point where I have to call anybody out and make a big deal about it. Uh, but there's two areas I'm thinking about specifically I'm wanting to talk about is one, using our mouths can be offensive and cause, uh, cause problems when we use what might be cons considered to somebody else bad words, right? Cuss words or whatever you call it. And uh, you think about little children here and uh, really, not even in the Christian world, but even, even people in uh, the world, right, have some sorts of standards where they'll tell their kids, oh, you're not supposed to say this word, don't use that word, or whatever. And now, look, we don't go to the world to get all of our information of what words to say, what not to say, I understand that. And the Bible says that all, words and, uh, all the words of God are pure words, and so if we're saying something from the Bible, I understand uh, there's nothing evil about a word that we use that. But sometimes we'll use a certain word in a, in a way uh, that could be offensive to somebody. They don't catch that. They don't understand that. We need to explain it. We need to be careful how we do that. That's one of our responsibilities as, uh, as Christians to think about that. And, uh, you know, I'll maybe touch on that a little bit more. 
But one of the things I was thinking of is actually, and uh, Brother Bo's here, but uh, in a few weeks, whatever, I'm going to go down to uh, Oklahoma City and I'm going to get to preach out there. Praise the Lord for that. And I think I know what message I'm going to preach. I've been wanting to preach a message for a long time that's kind of been on my heart and in my mind, and I just haven't had the occasion to use it. But the title of the message has what some people would say a cuss word in it. <laughs> and you guys know me well enough to know that's just not me, right? <laughs> so I'm going to have to be real careful how I present this, how I explain it, but it's necessary for the, uh, for the message. And so I'm kind of praying for wisdom on that. I want to be careful. The last thing I want to do is get up somewhere and just offend people. Make them think, hey, this guy can't control his tongue, right? <laughs> And uh, most of you guys aren't worried about that, but, but, but we have to be careful about that. Now, the other thing is not just saying a bad word that would offend somebody in the wrong way. Look, we know offenses have to come. We're going to offend people when we preach the Bible, say certain things. But unnecessary offenses, you know what I'm talking about? We don't have to, we don't have to offend them. We've got to be careful about that. But not only that, controlling our tongue when it comes to arguing with somebody or rebuking somebody. Now, I love a lot of guys I've met, zealous for the Lord, you know, sound in doctrine, and uh, they want to let the whole world know, right? But sometimes they don't think about uh, their c controlling the tongue or not letting it get out of hand. And, you know, I was thinking about, uh, I was talking to somebody about a video somebody put out. And in that video, he's rebuking some pastors and stuff like that. And he's got our sweatshirt on. It says, uh, uh, Iola Baptist Temple, KC Mission. And I'm thinking, anybody could be watching that, and it just totally offends them. And he might, not think, he might think he's doing something good, but really that could start things getting out of control. And people, uh, you know, thinking, man, that's a bad testimony uh, for the church. And so uh, there's different reasons or different ways in which we can be offensive or hurtful with our tongue. And uh, you're probably not going to offend me in any of these areas, right? You can rebuke me. You can say bad things, you know, uh, argue with something that I teach or something. I think I'm a pretty patient guy, and I like to have discussions. In fact, some people interpret that as debating or being ugly. I like to have discussions about these things. Let's talk about it, right? You're probably not going to offend me. You could probably cuss in front of me, and it's probably not going to offend me, you know what I mean? Because of... Uh, yeah, it's like this lady, I used to work for this lady, and she said, uh, she would start cussing, and she knew I was in Bible college at the time, and she'd start cussing, and she'd be like, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, later on, she'd let another one slip, and she's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, you know, you're not offending me. I know what all the words are. I could use any of them if I wanted to. <laughs> you know, you're not offending me at all, right? And so you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to offend you. I mean, if it's an offensive word... Right. If it's something that would be dishonored to God, well, he's the one you need to worry about. If, it's, if I had my kids nearby, I might say, hey, you know, I teach my kids that's a bad word or something like that. And so uh, that's just kind of like I said, even the world has standards on that. You know, you watch a, uh, uh, if you watched a movie, there would be certain ratings. Hey, this, you know, this is this certain rating because it has so many bad words in it or something like that. And yet a lot of Christians have no, uh, no filter on that. And here's the problem with that. Here are some things that we can do, I mean, the, the problems that can come from that. Number one, we can cause others to think it's okay to not control their tongue by watching us. We're showing them, hey, man, just say whatever you want to say. Uh, and you might think, no, 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 but what I, what I said wasn't a bad word. But if they're listening to you and they don't realize that, they say, hey, I, I don't need to control my tongue. You know, who's really going to define what a good word is and a bad word is? But how about we don't try to figure out how close we can get to saying bad word. We just try to control our mouths. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered uh, in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, and there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol 
unto his hour, unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Look, if I eat something offered to an idol, I don't all of a sudden become a pagan. Right? I don't all of a sudden become this unholy being because what, what, what went into me was, was like cursed by some spell that was put on the meat or something like that. You understand? I'm not worried about that. You guys ever, uh, I knew this guy from Africa, verse 9, I try to remember where I left off here. I knew this guy, he was from Africa, and, uh, and his nails were just really super long. And I remember thinking, man, why don't you clip your nails? And he told me one day, he said, oh, I'm afraid to clip my nails. If I clip my nails, all someone has to do is get one of those nails and they could uh, put a curse on that nail, kind of like voodoo or something like that. He's like, and they would be able to like curse me through having my nail. And so he wouldn't curse the nails. I was like, now there's some wicked stuff out there. There's spells people can do. I believe the, the, the demons have power to do some, to some kind of crazy stuff, right? But I'm not worried about somebody getting my nails. <laughs> I'm not worried about somebody having a voodoo doll and putting needles in it or something like that. Doesn't bother me one bit, right? I don't care about like saying the, the wrong word and everybody's like, oh, he said the, you know, the curse. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know that it's not going to do anything different to me. I can eat whatever I want. It's not going to affect me, you know. I prayed before it before I ate it. <laughs> There's not, it's clean through the word and I'm not going to have to worry about that. But here's the thing, eating something sacrifice to an idol somebody else looks at that and says oh i guess he doesn't have a problem with that relationship that people have with those idols and i don't know how exactly it could happen but there's a chance that somebody could see that and they could be offended by that you could actually cause them to stumble my wife likes to cook and i like her to cook she's a good cook right <laughs> some recipes call for cooking alcohol cooking uh, wines or something like that and it all burns out of there but, you know, my wife won't go somewhere where she has to get a, a bottle of something that looks like wine so that she can cook with it. And, every, and somebody might be walking down the store saying, oh, she drinks. It's okay to drink, right? So she won't do that. Staying away from that appearance, you know. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, I didn't finish. That's okay. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two, verse 16. <clears throat> For so is the will of God, verse 15. So is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Look at first Corinthians six. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, all things are lawful unto me. Aren't you glad for the liberty that we have in Christ? I mean, we don't have to live off every little detail of the law. You ever saw, now, now the, the Jews, I understand to this day and even in Jesus' day, they had taken it to another level. Like they took Old Testament laws and made how many steps that you can take on the Sabbath day and, and all these things to a crazy level. And it's even gotten worse over the years. You ever watched a Jew like nowadays, a modern Jew, and like try to explain? I'm talking about somebody who's seriously into the religion and all the things that they do. Like you can only take the elevator up so many floors. Hey, you, you know what I'm talking about? Like I can't remember what it is, but it has something to do with pushing the buttons and they, 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 they apply the Old Testament scriptures. It's just weird, okay? It's real weird. And I'm, but I'm like, you know, if I had to think about all the different tithing uh commands in the Old Testament, and I had to think of all the different days that I had to, uh, had to you know, uh, observe and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Man, that would be just a life of just kind of bondage, it would seem like, right? But the Bible says this, all things are lawful unto me. Well, praise the Lord for that, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Look at... Uh, uh, well, let me just move on. So we can offend somebody to the point where we cause them to offend thinking that something is okay to do, right, that would cause them to go down the wrong path. We could also offend them to where, look at, get this, 
we lose their attention of being able to preach to them the truth. Now, that's just not, although it's most important that we don't do this for the unsaved people, right? If an unsaved person says, I'm not going to listen to that person because he offended me in this way. And I'm not talking about offended like, again, like you, you told them the truth straight from the Bible. Hey, there's, there's, you know, you don't avoid, the, in all things, you know, we're going to offend when we preach the truth. We understand that. It's God's word that offends. But I'm saying if you just flippantly said something with your mouth, not thinking, not controlling your tongue, and now that person says, Man, I don't want to listen to anything that guy has to say. You just lost your opportunity to be able to reach them for the gospel. Okay? But let me take it a step further. It's not just the saved people that we're trying to win. Listen, we're trying to win people who have false doctrine. And we're trying to show them correct doctrine. Right? And how many of them say, man, I'm not going to listen to anything you, you say because of one Facebook post. Or because of one, you know, somebody ran off the mouth and they said, man, I'm not listening. That guy's a wacko, right? Now, again, I understand people are going to get offended. There's, we can only do so much, right? Everything that, just try your best not to offend. I understand that. But, uh, but there are obviously things that we could do, things that we could uh, avoid that would allow us to be able to, you know, somebody will listen to us. Say, hey, I've watched that guy. He showed himself somebody who has, can, can control his mouth, control his actions and his conversation. And I want to listen to what that guy has to say. Okay, how do, uh, how do fires get started? <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of ways in which fires get started and then how we can prevent them based on that, okay? Number one is this, real simple. When there are lots of opportunities... For the fire to get started, it's more likely to get started. That's deep, I know. I'm, I'm, it's one of those things you got to really think here. When there are lots of opportunities, right, for the fire to get started, it's more likely there's going to be a fire. Picture in your mind, if you would, just an old house. All uh, Brother uh, Austin can picture this, I'm sure. All the wiring in the house is messed up and old. You know, the, the wires in there, they don't have proper insulation and stuff like that. And then you got people plugging in way too many things into one outlet, and you got this extension uh, on top of another one, and you got all these real dangerous, right? And then you got like open flames, you know, people with candles and different types of heating things where there's open flame, where there's right next to curtains that are hanging and all that kind of stuff. Look, I've seen those kinds of things. I've done it myself a few times. <laughs> But in your mind, in that situation, you should look at that scenario and say, whoa, probably a fire is going to break out here if we're not careful. We don't take proper action, right? When there's lots of opportunities, then it's more likely that there's going to be a fire. Go back to our text here in James chapter 3. I really like this verse, and I wish people could get this. Some people think that a pastor or a preacher in general, of whatever kind of preacher they might be, or a teacher, or whatever, like they just, well, they just think they know everything. They just like hearing themselves talk. They just want to run their mouth all the time. And there might be a little bit of truth in that, but here's the verse I want people to get. Look, verse number one, chapter three, my brethren, be not many masters. You ever heard of the term, there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians? <laughs> Be not many masters. Everybody wants to teach. Everybody wants to give their opinion. Everybody wants to be the preacher, right? Be not many masters. Why? Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. I don't think that means condemnation from God necessarily. If you read on, it says, For in many things we offend all. Why are we more likely to, to offend people whenever we're a preacher of the Word of God? Why? Because we're preaching the Word of God. <laughs> and that offends people. You know, we're, we have to get up and say things, uh, you know, and sometimes later on we're like, whoa, man, that, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. Thankfully, I preach to a lot of uh, uh, older folks who are very forgiving in Iola, right? But one time, I don't remember why, but I was just talking about uh, the future, looking into the future, and I was like, one of these days I'm going to bury most of you guys. And I realized after I said that, that probably wouldn't, didn't come out quite right, <laughs> right? right? And sometimes there's things like that. You'll say something and be like, man, I wish I could take that back. Or worse yet, uh, and again, thankfully people are forgiving, but uh, you've noticed my kind of ADD type mind, right? A lot of times I don't think about what's coming out of my mouth or I'm thinking about another thought while I'm still saying what I was saying before. Does that make any sense? And sometimes what I say is actually the opposite of what I mean. Have you ever done that? Like you're giving like 
praise to the devil or something like that. You don't even know you did it, but everybody's looking like, I can't believe he just said that, right? I, I don't know how those things happen, right? But your mind's just going and you're saying the wrong words. I do that all the time. Look, the more times you get in front of people, and the more times you're talking, the more opportunity they can get offended, the more opportunity you're going to be condemned or they're going to say, hey, we don't like that guy. We don't want anything to do with that guy. And here's what I'm trying to say about that. Look, not everybody has to be in that situation. <laughs> not everybody has to be one of those people. right? Well, I just can't wait to get persecuted for Christ. Well, that's great. But maybe you don't need to be persecuted by putting this video online and condemning everybody and offending everybody and getting in people's faces and rebuking them. And call. Maybe that's not necessarily your calling. <laughs> Right? Maybe you can tone it down a little bit and start learning how to control the tongue. Let the guys uh, who God has, has called to do that and have proven themselves and taken some time to, uh, uh, to kind of learn. I'm not saying anybody's perfect at it. I'm certainly not. But they've learned kind of how to handle some things patiently and in a loving manner and, uh, and use a little bit of wisdom. Let them be the ones that do the, the talking and the fighting and all that stuff. You don't have to just say, hey, I just want to jump in this fight. Be like Peter. I just want to cut somebody's ear off. <laughs> no, no. Whoa, slow down a little bit, right? Control the tongue because it's going to get out of control, okay? So the first way a fire gets started is there's lots of opportunities for that fire to get started. And, uh, and you don't necessarily have to be the one that always opens up your mouth and tries to uh, uh, take everything in your own hands. And again, I appreciate people. I know a lot of people who have, uh, who have quit using social media Right, because they say, "Man, I just couldn't. Uh, I just could, I, oh, everything ended up in a fight. Everything ended up somebody getting mad at me. Family members not wanting to talk to me anymore, whatever, because of just stupid social media." Right, and I appreciate people that say, "You know, I, I'm just going to get off of it. There's no reason for me to cause problems and start fires and all that kind of stuff." Now, look, I believe there's a great place for social media. It's online platform. It's kind of like public preaching in many ways. And I think that there's a way to do it. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I'm just saying, hey, if one guy does that, not everybody, that doesn't mean that everybody has to get on there and start giving their two cents about everything uh, that they disagree with other preachers on or something like that. You know what I mean? <coughs> I'm not saying nobody can do that. I'm just saying we got to be careful not to think that we all need to be the ones that do it because that just makes more opportunities for more offenses to come, more fires to break out, if you will. And the fire is destructive, man. It's, it's real powerful. It can do a lot of damage. And it can burn bridges that weren't supposed to be burned. <laughs> okay, here's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You see, in the life of, of Paul, and I, we know he offended people, right? He even offended his friend Barnabas. <laughs> we know he got himself into trouble, but he said, you know, I try to bring myself into subjection. I try to control my body. And one of the things that we need to control is the tongue, okay? Uh, so here's a similar thought. Not only is there a fire more likely to break out when there's more opportunities, that makes sense, but here's another thing. Uh, when the conditions are just right, when the conditions are just right. On a hot day, a uh, firefighter knows this, on a hot day, real sunny, hasn't rained in a while, everything, the weather's real dry, there's going to be a grass fire somewhere. I mean, that's just the way it is. The conditions are just all right for a grass fire. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, what, what we uh, need to do as Christians, recognizing that there are times we walk into a situation and we say, man, all the conditions are right, right here for a big fire to break out. I, I hope everybody in here knows those situations when you get there. I'm afraid some people don't know. It's like they just start lighting matches, <laughs> setting off fireworks and all that kind of stuff. No, this is a situation where it's going to take some uh, preparation. It's going to take some uh, uh, consideration about what needs to be done here, uh, you know, we don't need to, uh, we need to remove the fuel and not add fuel. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, when those situations are there, we have to be uh, prepared. How do we be prepared? Here's the key, man. Everything in your life, you know this, I know this. Everything in our life, here's how you prepare for those situations. You have got to be prayed up. You have got to be well read in your Bible, <laughs> in communication with the Lord on a daily basis uh, so that you can Walk in the Spirit, right? Uh, Galatians 5, 17. 
Galatians 5, 17. This is the only way you're going to stop these quote-unquote for, forest fires from burning. Now, some fires need to burn, I mean, but it needs to be a controlled fire, <laughs> right? Sometimes the, the grass in the field needs to get burned up, but, but, but it needs to be done uh, with the right kind of supervision. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. <clears throat> For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. We all know that, don't we? And the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. Oh, so when you get saved, you don't just automatically quit sinning, in case you didn't know. <laughs> the flesh and the spirit, they're going to battle for, for until this body's dead. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would, but if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, and cleanless lasciviousness. Now all those kind of go together. Idolatry, witchcraft, those kind of go together. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Okay, why? What, why would somebody be in, do all these things, and where do they come from? Well, they come from the flesh, right? So what we got to do is figure out a way to deny the flesh and walk in the Spirit. How do we do that? Well, you're going to have to pray, for one thing. You're going to have to uh, try to deny yourself all those, those, those lusts and, and fill yourself with the Word of God and prayer and uh, sometimes even fasting, if the case uh, means you know you're going to get into a situation where it's going to be really tough to control your mouth or something like that. Otherwise, there's going to be envyings, murders, uh, hopefully not murders, <laughs> it could be though, heresies, seditions, strife, wrath, emulations, variance, hatred. Okay, those are all the things that come from that. But, what's it say, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, now this is why we want to walk in the Spirit, right? So that we can do these things that we can't naturally do in the flesh. Our love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. You know what meekness is? You know, the Bible says that Moses was a meek man, right? Now, that doesn't mean he was a little sissy. No, he could kill you with his bare hands if he wanted to. Right? He had the power. And not only did he have the physical power and the physical strength, he had God on his side. And if somebody, you know... Uh, made fun of him or talked bad about him or, or criticized him for his choice of wife, <laughs> God will say, I'm going to step in and take care of this situation, right? But whenever guys came to him, you think about Korah, gets this big group of all the, the notable men in the, in, the, in the camp, and they all come together and they say, that's it, Moses, we're tired of you take too much upon yourself. And they start rebuking him to his face. You think, man, he could have just started whipping people up and chewing them up, you know, uh, uh, praying fire down from heaven. I don't know. He could have done that. But what's he do instead? He falls on his face and he prays to God. It's not because he was weak and he was afraid of Korah, right? He was doing actually the thing that is, is, is sometimes perceived as weakness, but it's actually a, lot, a huge strength, and that is meekness. Amen. Meekness is knowing that you have the power to do something, but physically restraining yourself from doing it because you know it's better for the situation. And that's tough, man. It's easy to lash out on somebody. I like being sarcastic. I like being a little witty sometimes, right? You like uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, have a battle of words with somebody. Sometimes it's fun. I, um, I don't admit it. <laughs> but what's best is to say, you know what? I probably could put that person down, bring up something from their past, you know, really, uh, really just dig the knife into their back, right? But instead, I'm just going to say something nice to them or I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Amen. That takes a lot of restraint, and that's hard. Uh, uh, but that's something that we can do, but not in the flesh. We can do if we're walking in the Spirit, and it's something that it gets easier in time if, the, if a person uh, is practicing and walking in the Spirit. Where was I? Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, right? Again, we have liberty in Christ. If we're walking in the Spirit, we don't really have to worry about, oh, did I do this right? Did I do that right? Am I pleasing to the Father? Whatever. We're just walking in the Spirit. Does that make sense? We don't have to just sit there and, and try to worry about what laws we have, to take, uh, we have to obey and all that. We're just trying to honor God and we're trying to live for God. God doesn't want us to be at variance with everybody and just start causing all of these problems and, and all these fires. Okay? And so one thing we have to do, I mean, think about it. You're going into... 
a situation where there's, it's likely to be a fire, what are you going to do, man? You're going to saturate that thing. Saturate it. Get you a, get you a hose, <laughs> you know, and wet down the area so that there's no fire. Farmers that do that sometimes in fields and stuff like that so they know that there's not going to be a fire. You're going to saturate it. And what we have to do as Christians, and you think, man, I don't want to be a phony. Well, I don't want you to be a phony either. I want it to be sincere, speaking the truth in love, not speaking the truth in, uh, in, in being a false prophet, you know, speaking the truth and deceiving people into thinking something. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuinely saying, I'm going to speak the truth, but I'm going to be careful in mind uh, my, the way that I say it. I'm going to saturate it with grace and kindness and love. And here's what Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. I'll read it again. Let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. One of the best things that we can do is just walk in the spirit, obviously, and then just make ourselves just saturate everything we do with, with kindness and love. And I don't want to sound like Joel Osteen up here, <laughs> right? Smiling and saying, well, just love everybody, speak kind. I understand there's time people are going to be offended, time we got to say things that aren't popular to be said, but that doesn't mean that we have to go around just like a loose cannon and just, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not tempering that. we got to be really careful about that. Another thing we can do, very important as well, is uh, when you're getting into a situation where you're going to talk to somebody, rebuke somebody, whatever, where you're anticipating, hey, this might be a possibility for a fire, <laughs> you know, bring somebody along with you, you know, have somebody pray with you, accountability, right, two heads are better than one, and uh, bring them along with you, and temper, you can temper one another, you can pray with one another, and you can help control your tongue that way, okay, but here's the bottom line, when it comes to anything in life, and I'm going to say primarily with this, uh, because of this message, controlling the tongue, don't be negligent. That's the idea. Don't be negligent. Don't leave the, the, the uh, what was the thing, uh, the lantern in the barn with the cow <laughs> during a dry season, right? You're going to start the Chicago fire. <laughs> don't, st don't be negligent. Don't leave uh, all the outlets and the extension cords and all plugged in and, and open fires going underneath the curtains and all that kind of stuff. Don't be negligent. Here's, here's the three things. It's just kind of a recap, conclusion. Try to bathe everything in prayer and godly wisdom before acting upon it. That's going to be key, right? Because you can't do it in your own strength. You need God's help. So bathe that in prayer, godly wisdom. Number two, always try to be aware of who you are talking to and what message you're trying to communicate. You get in the flesh, you just start saying whatever just comes out, right? <laughs> whatever you, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I thought about that old, uh, I know you've all seen it, a bunch of, a bunch of wicked people, but Rocky Balboa. <laughs> you ever watch that fight? And, uh, and he punches uh, one guy in the face, and another guy punches him in the face, and then he punches the other guy in the face, and it's just like hit for hit for hit for hit. And you're thinking, man, you know what? Somebody could probably just put a stop to that. Say, I'm not going to hit you back. <laughs> hit you back. But sometimes in, in life, and I like boxing, that's a different thing, but, uh, but sometimes in life, we're like that with our words. It's like we have to have the last word. You know, you hurt me. I got to hurt you a little bit worse. I got to one-up you. I got to make this hurt, hurt worse. You know, and it's just like this battle just back and forth, and all someone has to do is just walk away from that. Let somebody else have the, have the last word, right? Uh, okay, always try to be aware of who you're talking to and what it is you're trying to communicate. Don't get distracted on that. And, uh, and again, on, on thinking about who it is that you're talking to, look, there's some people that you might say, I'm just not going to talk to that person. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to talk to that person because I do not think that the conversation is going to go well. Amen. And I don't think it's necessary, so I'm just not going to talk to them, right? Not talking about going out of your way to be rude to them or something like that, but just say, I'm just going to avoid that conflict, right? Remove that uh, possibility or opportunity for the fire. And finally this, although it's not the best case scenario, best case scenario would be to avoid the fire to begin with, okay? Best case scenario would have been uh, on that fire that, uh, that, that, bro that I was burning there in, the, uh, in the, the field on the farm. Best case scenario would be remove all the grass and stuff that was around that till it go all the way down to the dirt, right? Then you don't have to worry about it spreading. 
Best case scenario probably would have, had to, would have been to have some water on hand, a hose <laughs> or something on hand in case some fire gets out of to be prepared and have everything just work out perfectly. But the reality of the matter is the fire still broke out. Right? The reality of the matter is uh, I made a boo-boo, and, and now things are going to get out of control. Sometimes I guarantee you you're going to mess up, you're going to hurt somebody with your mouth. You're going to do the wrong thing. You're going to offend somebody. It is not impossible to restore that. It's not impossible to put that fire out and fix it. It might cause scars. It might, uh, you know, there might be some barriers here that are, that are put up or some things that are burned, bridges that are burned. But you can still repair the damage. I want to finish reading and closing the rest of that chapter. The rest of the chapter in James, chapter 3, let's go to verse 9. Let's just back up to uh, verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace of them that make peace. Lord, we ask your blessings on the service. Lord, work in our hearts so we might remember in this life, short time that we have, we've got a job to do, we've got to reach people, uh, we've got to uh, help correct false doctrine, uh, but we got to uh, see people saved and have doors and opportunities open for us to, uh, 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 to win people to you, Lord, and to your ways and your truth. Help us not mess that up, Lord, by letting our tongues get out of control and uh, saying things that would, uh, would hinder us from having those opportunities. Lord, uh, we know that the only way we can do that is by walking in the Spirit and denying the flesh, Lord, so help us to do that. Help keep us in tune with you and your word and help keep us uh, in prayer with you, uh, praying without ceasing, Lord, that we might uh, be able to, to the best of our ability, control our tongue and be perfect, Lord, for, like Jesus said, be ye perfect. Jesus, name I pray. Amen.